Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of our Dean, Michael Trick, I'm pleased to open the Richard M. Seyert Lecture in Business Administration, the Distinguished Lecture in Business Administration. This lecture series was actually named after Dr. Seyert, who was the sixth president of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and he also served as a dean of the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, GSIA, which is the former name of the Tepper uh, School of Business. And today, as part of the Sayert Lecture Series, we are honored to have Dr. Anita williams Woolley with us today to present her work on collective intelligence and the future of organizations. Anita williams Woolley is a professor of organization behavior and the associate dean of research at Carnegie Mellon University uh, Tepper School of Business. <clears throat> Professor Woolley received her doctorate in organizational behavior from Harvard University, and her research includes seminal work on team collective intelligence, which was first published in Science <coughs> in 2010, and has been featured in over 5,000 publications and media outlets since. Her papers have been published in Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Academy of Management Review, Organization Science, and Management Science, amongst others. And her research has been funded by grants from the National Science Foundation, the US Army, and DARPA, <clears throat> as well as private corporations. Currently, Professor Woolley is a senior editor at Organization Science and a founding associate editor of Collective Intelligence. At the Tepper School, she teaches courses on managing teams and leading global and distributed teams. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Woolley for her lecture on collective intelligence and the future of organizations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's my first uh, visit to CMU here. Uh, and uh, I've just enjoyed it so much, and I'm sure I will continue to. And it's also a great honor to be giving a lecture in the name of Richard Seyert. Um, and in fact, um, it really relates to where I start with a lot of the research I've been doing. Um, and so I, I promise I did not, um, uh, this is a, a a way that I often explain the background of my research uh, because it was very influential to me even as a doctoral student when I was at Harvard and had no idea that I would eventually have the privilege of working at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so Herb Simon was among the founding faculty along with Richard Sire and others of the Graduate School of Industrial Administration uh, just after World War II uh, because prior to that, there were actually only two business schools in the world. Uh, there was Harvard and there was Stanford. Uh, and they uh, taught mostly by uh, case study, example, war stories, if you were. And so what, uh, what Herbert Simon and uh, colleagues and the people who had the vision to start uh, the Graduate School of Industrial Administration really wanted to bring was management science. Right? The idea that you could use evidence to inform uh, managerial decision making to improve the quality of organizations, to help organizations be more efficient uh, and more effective. And so uh, while many times, you know, we, at, the, at the time, people were struggling to figure out you know, how to gear up these machines, they brought ideas around how to structure organizations, to structure roles and workflows, um, and to create these pillars, as we came to know them, uh, people, processes, and incentives. And so these are actually the pillars of our PhD program. Uh, they're the pillars of uh, what we teach uh, a lot of our MBA students, and they're foundational to what a lot of leaders think about uh, in their organizations today. And so I'm proud to have that um, as part of our heritage at, at Carnegie Mellon as it's been so influential. So uh, in the 30 plus years after World War II, uh, pretty much every major university, certainly in the US and soon after around the world had business programs um, and were very much influenced by these ideas. 
But in the ensuing time since, what we know is that information has grown rapidly. The creation and the consumption of information globally. Um, and in, in what's really startling uh, as we look at these trends is to note, and I think we've all experienced this ourselves, uh, you know, this, this rapid growth. Uh, and it's also been accompanied by uh, global interconnectedness. The information interconnectedness around the globe has also continued to grow much faster than things like trade interconnectedness. And so when we look at trends of trade or people interconnectedness globally, we see you know, dips around various financial recessions, certainly the COVID pandemic, but the information interconnectedness continues to grow. And so this has really created a much different environment than the ones that uh, Herbert Simon and Richard Seyard and others were thinking about when they were first identifying these pillars of management science. Uh, it's one that is rapidly changing. It requires a lot of monitoring uh, of the environment and adaptation on the part of organizations. Another thing that it has done is it has led to more specialization uh, and which has required uh, in some way, in many ways, more teamwork. So the specialization piece, uh, for example, uh, just to give you a few numbers around this, in medicine around the world, when we look at medical systems in, in developed countries, <coughs> in the 1970s, the average patient uh, during a hospital stay would be treated by around two, two and a half providers. Currently, uh, the average is above 20 providers. The number of doctors in that time has not increased tenfold. It has increased maybe two to three times, depending on uh, how you're counting. What has happened is specialization. <coughs> With that rapid growth of information uh, in many different professions, people have increasingly specialized, which means that uh, uh, most professionals are involved in many more projects, problems, situations where they have to coordinate with others than was true a few decades ago, right? So the doctors who are part of treating these patients are seeing many more patients a day than used to be the case, and they coordinate with the other professionals who are involved in those same cases. We also see it in industry. So in 1970s, not a lot of teamwork across various industries. If you're talking about manufacturing, um, even uh, you know, various professional services, but now everybody uh, is working in teams. And in fact, they're often working in multiple teams. Uh, and so you see multiple teams around the globe even, and I'm sure many of you experience this as well, uh, where people are coordinating asynchronously or else they're on meetings in the middle of the night, uh, but with multiple people in multiple locations uh, and having to manage uh, these various uh, commitments uh, across these different teams. And so what this really means is that for many of us, our calendars look like this. I know mine certainly does, where you're expected to be at a couple of different places at the same time uh, with these different commitments you have. And so the reality of many organizations, uh, even though the plan, the design looks like this, the reality can look much more like this, right? And so what it starts to bring about is the idea that maybe we have to think about the ways organizations are structured slightly differently than might have been true in the past. Because often it's the case that these workers who are on multiple teams, there's no one leader or manager who has a complete handle on what they're doing. They themselves are actually making the decisions about how to allocate their time, what to prioritize, because they are the only one who has a complete view of all of what they're involved in. Uh, and so it's a very different kind of perspective and world, really, uh, than uh, existed when we were thinking more in terms of pillars and structures uh, for creating collective rationality. So a field that has thought a lot about how systems adapt and change to accomplish goals in a wide variety of environments is the field of research on intelligence. 
And often when we think about intelligence, we, many of us, if we're familiar with it, are familiar with it in the context of individual intelligence. Uh, anybody who has gone through any sort of formal schooling has been subject to some form of an IQ test or a general intelligence test. But general intelligence conceptually is this idea that there's an underlying ability that individuals have to perform well across many different environments, to work uh, effectively or at the same level of capability uh, in many different domains. And so uh, whether it's you know, different uh, stimuli that they're dealing with, verbal, spatial, visual, uh, there have been lots of debates in the intelligence literature about how many intelligences there are, are there specialized intelligence, et cetera. But the empirical, widely replicated empirical uh, fact is that there, uh, most uh, studies do produce evidence of this underlying single general intelligence factor that can be used to predict future performance for individuals, whether we're talking about in school environments or in their job or even things like life expectancy has recently been predicted based on this. And so we started to wonder if in addition to general intelligence, individual general intelligence, when we're talking about work in groups and teams and collectives, if there might not be a collective intelligence, an ability of a particular group or uh, even organization, if you will, to consistently marshal high levels of effort from everybody and motivation, to coordinate focus so that we get our, our highest priority items done, to make the best use of the skills of the members uh, that they have available. And so up until the time we started to think about this, when we talked about intelligence in teams, it was as a function of the individual members. If you, if you wanted a smart team, you wanted to put together smart people, right? Uh, but what we started to see in some of our data was that that wasn't always the case. And sometimes I make a little joke because I'm a faculty member that, you know, I've been in some groups of very smart people that are not necessarily the smartest teams, you know? <laughs> uh, there, and so it's, it's not always the case that those are the same thing, right? And that was really the intuition that was driving some of our questions as we started uh, doing the research on collective intelligence. And so um, we uh, created a collective intelligence test uh, to give to teams to really start to look at if, whoops, went too far, uh, to see if some teams were good at working on a variety of problems you know, consistently uh, more than others. And so if you think about, again, for individuals, if you see that an individual is really good at, say, doing math problems, you wouldn't say that that individual necessarily is intelligent. Uh, you'd say they're very good at math problems. But when you see an individual who's good at a variety of things, that leads to the inference of intelligence. And so we were doing, taking the same approach but using group-based tasks and having groups work together on these tasks and seeing if we uh, found evidence of this general collective intelligence. And to cut to the chase, we did. Uh, we found that uh, groups that uh, you know, did one type of task well tended to do other types of tasks well, and we calculated a collective intelligence score based on how they performed, and used that to predict then future performance when we brought them back together to work on a more complex task. And what we found was that collective intelligence was a much better predictor of how those groups performed than knowing the average IQ of members or even uh, the highest IQ of members. And so we've replicated this a few times. And again, the red bar is how strong a predictor collective intelligence is of the team's future performance compared to the average or even the highest member intelligence. And so now, as we've gone through our research in the ensuing you know, 15 plus years uh, since it all started, uh, we've been looking at, OK, well, if individual intelligence isn't necessarily the biggest predictor of collective intelligence, what is? Uh, and so we've looked at a variety of different kinds of things that might contribute. Well, and first of all, we, we looked at things that we 
thought would contribute, but that didn't, that were surprising. So a few things that were not predictive were things like how satisfied is the group? Like how cohesive are they? You know, if I say, do you like to hang out together? That wasn't really a predictor of a team being collectively intelligent. And so that sort of challenges some of our standard ideas about how you create collective intelligence. It's not just about team building. Not that that hurts, but that's not, it maybe helps but isn't sufficient right, to create collective intelligence. But there were some other things that, that were uh, consistent uh, predictors. And so we found that various forms of diversity are beneficial for collective intelligence. And so the first thing that showed up in our data, initially we saw um, a positive correlation between the proportion of women in the group and collective intelligence. Uh, over time, though, we've, as we've accumulated uh, you know, over 1,000 teams, we see kind of a curvilinear relationship where, um, so again, we're, we're giving teams this test. It, the uh, score is standardized, so average uh, of zero and a standard deviation of one. Uh, and so collective intelligence oscillates around you know, average until we have consistently more than half women in the group and then it's more consistently above average. But when we have only women, we see a lot of variability, but we, we see overall the mean uh, dip slightly. So there's some benefit to gender diversity, but with a uh, tilt toward maybe having more women. And I'll get to, in a moment, the reason underlying this, uh, but it's something that continually shows up in our data uh, and was not something we set out expecting. We weren't focusing on this um, initially. We find that other kinds of diversity are also beneficial for collective intelligence. So uh, in our studies, we see a benefit to um, racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, and what we find, and what is also found in other studies in the literature, is that often in uh, demographically diverse groups, people uh, process information more carefully. Right? They're kind of thinking more about what other people say. Maybe sometimes they have to work a little harder to understand what the person is saying if this comes along with different uh, dominant first languages. Uh, but they tend, as a group, to focus and pay attention more to information, and that results uh, in higher collective intelligence. And then finally, we do see uh, a benefit to cognitive diversity. We measure some cognitive styles uh, in many of our studies. There are certain cognitive styles that are uh, common in those who go into engineering and mathematics-oriented uh, sorts of fields. There's a different cognitive style that is common in the humanities and more writing-oriented fields. And there's a third cognitive style that is common in the visual arts and design. <laughs> And what we find is that uh, groups that need at least a moderate level of diversity across these cognitive styles to reach the highest levels of collective intelligence. When left to their own devices, groups that are very diverse, right, where they have everybody who has a different cognitive style and nobody who overlaps, <laughs> or not very much, uh, you see uh, that they can struggle. However, uh, studies I won't get into today uh, that we've done, we've looked at ways to uh, facilitate the work of those groups. And in those cases, we actually do see a continued benefit to the diversity, where this becomes more of a linear relationship. But this study was just done observationally, where we didn't intervene to help uh, the more diverse groups. So diversity is, is one piece of um, building collective intelligence. The second um, is synchrony. Uh, and so for this, first I'm going to tell you about this um, individual difference uh, that falls under the category of social intelligence, uh, specifically social perceptiveness. So we measure this in many of our studies using this test called the reading the mind and the eyes test where uh, participants look at 36 pictures of the eye region of the face and choose from options what this person is thinking or feeling. I won't put you on the spot and make you answer. Sometimes I do do this to my students, but I won't do it to you. Uh, this is a hard one. Um, so playful is the correct answer here. Although if you're thinking irritated, that's the most common not right answer. Uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, people who are uh, good at 
discerning what uh, these, these uh, individuals in the photos are thinking or feeling, are good at picking up on subtle cues and drawing inferences about mental states of other people, or even predicting how others are likely to respond if something happened or something was said, et cetera. So we find that when teams have a higher average ability uh, in, this, in this kind of a, a skill, that teams are more collectively intelligent, and that women, on average, tend to score higher on these kinds of tests than men. And so that is a lot of the reason why having more women in the group tends to lead to higher collective intelligence. Or what I tell my predominantly male classes of MBA students, it also means that if you work on developing this skill, you also contribute to a higher collective intelligence, whether you're male or female, right? Because this is about um, really contributing to the communication um, of the team. I should also point out that this is not just limited to reading eyes. This is a skill that generalizes to all kinds of different inputs. We've seen that this is important even for groups collaborating online via text chat. So uh, it's something that translates through these different modes of communication and ends up being important. One way that it facilitates coordination is through synchrony. So many uh, human beings in general have a tendency to mimic one another's facial expressions. And it turns out that the more closely somebody is attending to their conversation partner, the more they will tend to do this. And so we find in our studies that teams that have more of this facial expression uh, synchrony tend to be higher in collective intelligence. And if you have more people who are high in social perceptiveness, you tend to have more of this. However, this was like an initial study, and we did a follow-up study where we also looked at vocal cues because that's another area in which people interacting can synchronize. So when we think about pitch and speed and uh, all kinds of qualities of voice, they're actually very good ways to capture emotion. Uh, you can pick up a lot about people by looking at those changes, but then synchronizing is also something that happens when people interacting are closely attending to each other. And it turns out that that's an even stronger prediction, predictor of collective intelligence than facial expression mimicry. And sorry to the folks from Zoom, but it turns out that video conference sometimes <coughs> disrupts vocal synchrony. Uh, so we found that it was easier for collaborators to develop vocal synchrony when they were not using video conference, but just audio conference. So, uh, but more to come on that, I'm sure, because of course the world changes as we're all on Zoom more and more, so maybe who knows if the, the uh, effects change here. But that was what we found at the time of that study. So synchrony and characteristics that foster synchrony are part of uh, you know, building collective intelligence in teams. And then finally, engagement. And so here we're really looking at communication and uh, the uh, contribution of members to communication and work products within the team. So we find that uh, teams that are high in collective intelligence tend to have a high level of communication and more equal contribution to communication. So if you have one or a few people who are doing all of the talking, the team tends to be a lot less collectively intelligent. And you tend to have more of this uh, equal communication when you have more women in the group and you have people who are higher in social perceptiveness. So this is how this all comes together. Uh, the people in the group who have certain qualities tend to foster um, these processes within the group. And again, this also shows up online. So whether we're looking at email or text chat or vocal communication, the same pattern of a high level and high uh, equal engagement uh, tends to be a, an important contributor to developing collective intelligence. So as we sort of step back and look at the range of things that have predicted collective intelligence in teams, we're really starting to build a model more broadly about developing collective intelligence in both teams and other systems and what the contributors are. 
And so, for example, we see that a lot of the things related to diversity and other skill-based uh, and individual differences contribute to the development of memory. Uh, in groups. So for example, there's been work done by my colleague at uh, the Pittsburgh campus, Linda Argoti, on transactive memory systems. So when you have a group of individuals who have very different bases of knowledge, uh, those who are using it more effectively will develop a collective memory where they know, okay, well, I go to, I go to Selma if I need to know this, I go to, you know, and they tend to specialize and they can expand the total amount of information that as a group they can retain and use effectively. So diversity contributes to the development of collective memory. We also find that there are components of attention. So when we have uh, group members attending closely to one another, when they're aligning uh, their, their focus, uh, that we uh, also see that attention becomes better and they become more effective at using their collective attention, whether it's we all need to look at this together or we're gonna divide up and do different things uh, to be more efficient uh, at what we're working on. And then finally, reasoning. A high level of engagement and communication really contributes to the ability to, of, a, of a collective to align on goals, to make decisions, to keep everybody involved and committed in what the group is doing. And so the reason why we've really started to focus a lot on these uh, ideas of memory, attention, and reasoning is because any uh, system that is intelligent needs to accomplish these essential functions. Whether we're talking about the human brain, as these are the three basic systems of intelligence in the human brain based on uh, most of the research uh, on this. Also in technological systems, when we talk about artificial intelligence uh, and other uh, sorts of capabilities, you know, all of these uh, functions need to be accomplished. I mean, memory, of course, but also selecting what is the problem we're working on now? What is the priority? How do we decide? Uh, those have to be built into any sort of technological system that is operating in an intelligent fashion or groups of humans in our case, or groups of humans and computers, which is really where we're thinking of uh, in the future. And so we've really started to look at this as uh, a way to develop systems that can be collectively intelligent, that can deal with all of the uh, change and adaptation that is required given our information rich environment uh, that has overtaken the pillars of management science as we knew them. And so we think about this developing in a system, of course it starts with the individuals, right? Individuals come into uh, a group or an organization uh, with their own attention, memory, reasoning processes, as well as how they feel, you know, and other traits they might have, right? Uh, but these then are combined in what we think of as transactive processes. People are bringing their resources, they're looking to combine them with others so that they can pursue goals uh, in an environment that perhaps they couldn't pursue themselves uh, adequately or that would be more valuable uh, with these folks than if they went over here and were working with these folks. So it's a transactive process where people are combining uh, their individual resources to have more collective cognitive resources. And then finally, uh, this manifests in behaviors. And the behaviors that we look at in particular include how well is the group using the knowledge and skill of the members in the group? You know, have they figured out who knows what? Or are they having the wrong person do things because maybe that person is bossy and they they stood up and they said, I'm going to do this, even though they knew a lot less. I mean, if I was up here, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the wonderful man that helped me get my computer going, but if I kind of shoved him aside and said, no, I'm gonna do it, that would not be good use of knowledge and skill because clearly he knew it a whole lot better than I did. Or coordination of task strategy. You know, are we doing this efficiently or are we being very sort of inefficient in how we're getting work done given the resources we have? Or how hard are people working, right? And so these are the, th the ways that people sort of negotiate these issues in the environment that we've needed to negotiate since the beginning of humankind, right? 
combining our resources, combining our knowledge and skills to be able to do things we can't do otherwise to even survive. Um, but it's taking place in this much more dynamic process uh, through the interaction of these different systems. And so, here we go. Um, and so, this is really setting us up for Management Science 2.0. Right? where data is going to really drive the nature of the structure a particular collective or organization needs to take given their environment. So it could be that perhaps underlying these are the pillars that Herbert, Simon, and company identified oh so long ago, but perhaps the configuration of those pillars are not going to look exactly the same for every organization or maybe even every, you know, the parts of different organizations depending on what they're working on. Uh, and so that's what we're focused on in our research now. Because certainly we know that there is a lot of development in artificial intelligence uh, for production, right? We hear all kinds of uh, examples of uh, manufacturing being more efficient, customer service, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles are promised, uh, you know, and when that day will arrive, we're not sure. Uh, but all kinds of ways that uh, technology can help us do things faster, more efficiently, more effectively than was true before, right, to produce things. But here we're complementing that with a focus on coordination technology to augment the ways that we work together to be more effective. And for that, we need artificial social intelligence. Uh, algorithms that can figure out that the ways that these humans are trying to combine their efforts are not as effective as they might think they are. And certainly in this era of remote work and globally distributed remote work, it's not possible for any leader to completely have their hands around what's happening in a team. Are they working very effectively? I mean, it's just sort of a, a black box or sometimes it's just silence, right? And so here's where we think there might be some ways to provide these additional inputs, things that can be readily uh, gathered through communication patterns and, and work habits, et cetera, that would give a better picture, a more accurate picture of how a team is doing and maybe even facilitate uh, its work to be more effective. So to do this, um, I'm going back to these um, uh, behaviors that I mentioned that we think are observable indicators of the underlying function of the, the systems that give rise to collective intelligence. Uh, things like, are they using the knowledge and skill of the members effectively? So have they figured out who knows what and are they uh, specializing appropriately? Uh, is the team uh, coordinating their task strategy so that uh, they are working as efficiently as they can, especially in a time-limited uh, environment? Are they getting everybody to work hard and to be engaged and to stay committed? So for this, we're actually uh, looking at it in the context of a study currently. This is one of the projects that is funded by DARPA. Uh, and it's a project that is uh, called the uh, Artificial Social Intelligence for Successful Teamwork. The broader goal of that project is to develop algorithms that can coach teams. So it's a, a lofty goal. Uh, but where we're starting is, can we teach algorithms to detect teamwork? Uh, to figure out when a team is working well and when it isn't. So in this particular study, we have a test bed that is in a Minecraft environment, uh, and we've designed a search and rescue mission game that involves three roles, three specialized roles. This is an animation that is just replaying data that we captured uh, from one of the teams. But essentially, they need to go around this building. They need to move rubble and find victims and triage them and treat them and move them out of the way of further harm. And so there are three specialized roles. There's a medic who can clearly treat more of the victims than the others. There's a transporter who can move a lot faster than anyone else. And there's an engineer who can remove rubble uh, much more effectively. However, all of these roles can do the other tasks as well. They just can't do them as effectively as the specialists. And so one of the things we're interested in is do they coordinate so that they get the tasks done by the right person as much as possible? Uh, and so we are capturing the quality of teamwork as they go about doing this. And we're also looking at their score based on uh, you know, how many victims they saved. And the victims have different values, 
but the more valuable ones take longer, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a decision process around that. And so uh, just to uh, then we're looking at, do they use uh, the right person to do the right tasks? Uh, some teams that don't collaborate well in this, everybody just works on their own and tries to do everything, and it's very inefficient, and they're not, they don't do very well. Um, do they coordinate? One way that they become inefficient is people are covering the same ground a lot that other people have already covered, and so then they're not covering new ground in this sort of time-limited task. And then how hard are they working? How fast are they moving, or are people standing around? Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we're capturing to really try to predict and uh, capture in real time the collective intelligence of the team. And this is just, uh, you know, as the team is working, we're calculating these things in three-second intervals. And this is just a depiction um, of those metrics um, as they're sort of tracking what the team is doing. So you see the people running around. At first, they're doing OK on the metrics. But now you see they're working really hard, but not very effectively, right? You know, knowledge is they have the wrong people doing stuff. The strategy is bad because if you look at the tracings, you see like certain people going back and forth over the same ground over and over again. Uh, and so they're not communicating to let each other know, oh, I've already been there, that's clear, you can go over here, et cetera. And so, you know, clearly this is a team that uh, if you were a leader, you would want to stop stop them, ideally, way back here, and be like, all right, you know, this is where people start to feel burned out, right? They're working very hard, but not very effectively. And uh, let's just evaluate what we're doing, and maybe if we could coordinate a bit more, then we would be doing better, right? And so the idea here is to, uh, well, these could be used in a variety of ways, right? It could be used as an input to a leader who could make an intervention, it could be used, uh, we're, we're, we've done one study and we're about to do another, to give feedback to the team itself, to see, uh, you know, reflect to them so that they might stop uh, what some of the computer scientists in this DARPA project are doing or developing agents that will actually administer interventions. Um, but the difficulty, uh, and I say as my, you know, sort of like smug, social scientist uh, uh, role, like people are very complicated. And so you can, uh, what we've found in our studies is you can more readily uh, make people mad at uh, an ASI agent or, uh, you know, get them to quit uh, more easily than you can improve what they're doing. Just because at least at this stage uh, in time, having an agent tell a, t a human team what to do is not always well received. So uh, that's um, another subtlety. Uh, to kind of using these tools. But essentially what we find, uh, uh, kind of a companion to the test, the collective intelligence test I told you about earlier where the teams were completing tasks together specifically to measure collective intelligence, here we're capturing it through unobtrusive behavioral measures. So these measures actually allow us to you know, predict their future performance and their future collective intelligence. Uh, and so this is just a, a depiction of, okay, we capture their collective intelligence early on. It predicts their early performance. Their early performance then predicts their future collective intelligence later in that same mission, which predicts their early coordination behavior in the second mission and performance, et cetera. So there's patterns that develop in these teams, and these are teams that have not received any intervention, uh, where we can actually predict pretty well pretty early um, whether this team is on a positive trajectory or not. Um, and another analysis kind of getting at that same question from a slightly different angle uh, is this hidden Markov model analysis where we uh, capture the current state of the team and predict its future state. And so one is like not good, six is good, and what you see is you don't see a lot of leaping around because uh, teams that are not doing well tend to move into just a neighboring state and maybe get slightly better or slightly worse. Teams that are doing really well tend to uh, stay up in that region. And so it's just sort of confirming this idea that we can pick up on these things that are qualities in their underlying capability that are pretty consistent um, over the course of their work. 
And so just uh, you know, showing you what we're thinking about in terms of how such approaches could be used, um, certainly we're all familiar with AI as an assistant that simply augments our individual memory, attention, reasoning. I mean, we do it all the time. I have my, my phone go off and tell me, OK, you need to leave now for that meeting, given the traffic conditions, so that you're not late, uh, things like that. Uh, coach is sort of what we've been experimenting with more recently, giving feedback and saying, OK, team, you, know, you might want to look at how you're combining your skills, how you're coordinating your strategy, uh, but then you know, we could think more broadly about diagnosing systems, uh, perhaps someday at a low level managing systems, although I think that's a little ways off, but that is sort of the, the vision um, for some of this work as we move forward. So just to uh, wrap up here and leave a little time, how much time? A little time for questions, I'm good, okay. Um, Whereas what, you know, the, the founding of GSIA and the management science approach was a very important uh, founding step in sort of our thinking about how to structure organizations and arguably has enabled a lot of the economic growth that we've seen um, across many industries. Now we're sort of shifting to thinking it could be time that we have to think slightly differently given the information rich environment that we are living in today. And so thinking about how to structure uh, organizations so that they can develop these systems of collective memory, attention and reasoning and self-regulate uh, to be appropriate to the environment they're working in. Uh, and so those are, uh, you know, the, the key drivers of collective intelligence in these environments. And so the question will be, how do we uh, create the groundwork to allow these systems to evolve? And then finally, what are the possibilities as we think about ways for algorithms to sense the quality of human collaboration and relationships to use that, hopefully, ideally, to enrich those experiences? Because we know in many organizations that those who are involved in teamwork, and if that teamwork is rewarding, uh, they tend to be much more satisfied uh, with their work life overall. You have less burnout uh, and less turnover. And so if we could actually use uh, these kinds of inputs to improve uh, the working uh, experiences of people in more organizations, that would be really beneficial. So that... Uh, is the end for me. There's my email address. Uh, if you ever want to follow up on any of this, I uh, would love to hear from you. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions if people have them. So thank you. So thank you, Professor Woolley, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we are all members of, of a team in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure this has uh, re resonated with all of us. So let's open up for questions from so, the class. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Um, I have a question on diversity. Yeah. So I, I used to strongly believe that diversity correlates with higher productivities in team intelligence until I moved to Qatar. And I realized that it really depends on the leadership management style of the organization and the culture of the organization. The more political the organization is, the more hierarchical it is, the less likely that, productivity, that diversity will actually play a productive contributor to that. Have you looked at the combination of these dimensions? Yes, uh, so in, in a few different ways, because absolutely, I mean, in, in other research and some of mine, but certainly many others in the field have documented a variety of different challenges associated with diversity. Um, so what we find is that it may be conditional on creating the conditions for uh, people to participate and to you know, foster some of the other qualities I was talking about with engagement, for example, we see benefits of diversity above and beyond having that engagement. 
But uh, when you have a situation where engagement is suppressed, you know, it's not equal, it's not a high level, then you wouldn't see the benefits of diversity or, or many other things. Uh, one specific study that I did with some of my colleagues um, at Tepper, Rosalind Chow uh, was one of the other faculty involved. We were looking at this in, in more detail uh, in terms of what happens when somebody is in the minority or even like a solo member of their group uh, within a, a broader group. And what we found is that um, by and large, they, they tend to participate less. I mean, the reasons why we could go on about, and it may depend on what groups you're talking about, but when they, when they did participate, they had more influence. People paid more attention to what they said and it got incorporated more into the final answer that the group produced. In this case, it was a you know, kind of a decision-making problem solving scenario where we knew ahead of time who, uh, how much information, how much knowledge each group member had about that problem. So we could look at whether or not the group used that knowledge and how much influence different people had. So when the minority member spoke, they had more influence than somebody who was a majority member who had the same information. But the issue was, most of the time, you didn't hear from them as much as even the average member, let alone somebody who had the level of expertise they had. So the real uh, first step is to get them to speak up, and that's a two-sided equation, right? Uh, they have to have courage to speak up. And I'll, speaking as a woman, women are actually uh, among those who tend not to speak up when they're in the gender minority. Um, but then the other members of the group need to do what they can to make that uh, hospitable for that to happen. Um, so that, that's, that's among the things that we've looked at. I know that there are other complex issues that get in the way. So thank you. That was Maher uh, Hakim. Oh. He's a faculty member in business administration. Thank so you. can you introduce yourself? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. So this is a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. And it sounds like so. It's, so I have two questions. One is, it sounds like from your last answer that you can take a less productive team and by teaching them the principles, turn them into a more productive team. But, and that was my first question. Can you do that or do you just have to change the team? <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. And as an educator who teaches teamwork, I'd like to think that I could change them. Um, I think you can move the needle somewhat if you get them early. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done different um, things in my courses, for example, where I've measured collective intelligence of the teams at the beginning and also later, um, and it didn't improve as much as I had hoped. Um, and I, a lot of it is the other piece, and maybe this is what you're, you're thinking of too, uh, you know, just norms and patterns get set, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that are hard to disrupt. And so if you can set the right norms early, uh, perhaps you can have an influence. If you can maybe make some membership changes that are influential, perhaps you can make a major change to a team that is struggling. Um, but beyond that, <coughs> given current practices and so on, uh, we, it, it's unusual to see radical change um, in a team that's really struggling. That said, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps if uh, just in the same way that when I first had a smartphone, I didn't really know how to incorporate it into my life, but then over time you become reliant on it. You know, if there are ways to sort of reflect back to groups, you know, maybe uh, what I want to say, uh, objective information to show them that, okay, you know what, your group has, you know, these kinds of patterns that are really hard, har harming you and uh, even giving them the real-time feedback to help learn how to interact in a different way perhaps is possible. Um, so I'm hopeful about that eventually, uh -huh. but yeah. it's, it's hard to change, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And the second is, um, in thinking about burnout, so you're saying teams that work effectively have less of this sense of things. So my question is coming from a different angle. Uh -huh. um, as businesses find out how they can improve productivity through this coordination of, of qualities, mm -hmm. Well, they just say, oh, we can push them so much harder now. 
and just, you know, kind of the, yeah, you know, the burnout yeah, factor is Yeah, no, just absolutely. Horrible. So I think it's probably important to make a distinction between productivity, effectiveness, you know, and when we talk about collective intelligence, I think we're thinking more holistically, right? So we look at engagement, you know, as well as um, efficiency and use of knowledge and skill. And so if you just push on one of those levers, you're right, and you're probably going to uh, put the system out of balance, right? It's not going to be effective, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, if, if you try to just optimize on one dimension, it's not going to work. And uh, so I think that though, when I was mentioning uh, the, the issue about burnout, you know, some of the things that can counteract burnout can be, uh, you know, these effective collaboration relationships in part because it can counteract this loss of control as well as this kind of being overburdened because if you have this you know, good team you can reach back into. Hopefully you can get support both uh, instrumentally in doing the work, but also, you know, in other ways as well in terms of how you're doing, the feedback you might need, and, and the other kinds of support. So yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate just make them more productive. And yeah, <laughs> I would hate to be putting something out into the world that was taken to mean that. So thank you for the question. Mariana Papanastasio, I'm a yeah. member of the Business Administration Unit. Um, have you checked, because you mentioned the, the example of your phone, so the issue of inertia at a Leibenstein and the issue of rewards. The issue of inertia. Inertia following Leibenstein, since we talked about uh, the, this uh, line of uh, uh -huh. scholars, uh -huh. and uh, how rewards can affect uh, collective intelligence in teams. Thank you. Certainly. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the rewards piece first. So when we talk about the transactive reasoning system, one of uh, the functions that we think about there in a collectively intelligent system is that the, uh, it's handling the input from the environment to determine uh, whether or not the group is pursuing goals that are the most valuable and also whether they're aligned with members uh, you know, rewards and incentives. And so a well-functioning transactive reasoning system should be handling that issue in an ongoing way because it's a moving target, right? Um, and so it's, uh, I don't know if that's what you meant by rewards, but that when we think about it, it's in terms of this alignment piece, both with the environment and with each other. But inertia, so what is the issue of inertia that you're, you're wondering about? Because I'm... You spend time to learn about your mobile phone. So we have experienced inertias when we change, uh, let's say, the technologies, for instance. Oh. So could be inertia an obstacle, obviously, in uh, achieving collective intelligence. And that could lead, I mean, to this partial productivity, as Maher mentioned. So I think, I mean, uh, inertia is very interesting because we talk about inertia and X inefficiency. Mm -hmm. So how that affects. Um, yeah, yeah. So actually, I um, uh, thank you for that clarification. Um, one thing I, I sort of um, glossed over a little bit is the relationship of the different transactive um, systems to each other. Uh, and so if, again, these systems are operating as they should, um, so inertia could be uh, created by not recognizing a change uh, in the environment or you know, in, the, in the context that would require uh, or suggest that it would be optimal for the collective to change either what it's doing, how it's doing it, et cetera. So that's one way. But also that transactive reasoning system should then influence the ways that the other systems are working, right? So you could imagine a new tool being available that would then shift the calculus based on who has what skill, because suddenly, okay, there's this thing taken care of now because of this new capability, and so we need to shift our focus and use our resources to handle these other things. So I guess it does, it comes back to this transactive reasoning process and its influence on the other processes. And so the inertia can come, you know, through breakdown either in noticing or in influencing the process. 
uh, you know, lots of ways along the line, and that's why inertia is so common. But no, that's an interesting question. I should also think more about how, if there are other <coughs> places in the system where it's combated, but those are the ones. We'll have a meet. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll look for the answer then. No. <laughs> I Great. think we we'll just reached the time oh, for okay. the session. Right. Uh, um, we'd like to thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, this uh, means a lot to me, as I mentioned, just given the influence of Richard Sayer on my own work and also to get to know my colleagues here uh, at the university. So thank you very much. Thank you.